Please take a seat. We're ready to begin. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our chapel convocation on this, our celebration of President's Breakfast and the opportunity to hear from Mr. Walter Isaacson. The purpose of this convocation is to give you, our students, the opportunity to interact with one of the leading minds in our country and in our world, one of the great thought leaders, and truly one of the great writers, great biographers of our own time. Dr. Warren Rogers, professor of physics and our interim academic dean, will introduce the students and Mr. Isaacson in a moment. The purpose of this time is for us to engage in some careful questions and thoughtful responses to the topic uh, for today, which is looking at the great challenges that face us uh, in the global world and begin to think about what kind of response we can make to them, including the hope that each of you will feel called through your life and through your gifting to make a difference in the world with the skills and abilities that God has given you. This time, Dr. Warren Rogers will introduce our panel and our guests. Thank you, Dr. Beebe. Um, first, I'm gonna introduce our uh, guest of honor today, and then I'm going to allow each of the student panelists to introduce themselves before we get into the main part of our uh, convocation. And just a word about that. Um, the students have all read uh, Mr. Isaacson's book, Einstein, His Life and Universe, and are prepared to uh, engage in conversation with him about that book and some of the thoughts that he's presented in that book, uh, and in order that you would also be enriched by um, the book and his presence here on campus, and uh, we value very much the interaction that students have, uh, the opportunity for them to interact with our speaker this morning. And so um, let me first introduce our, our uh, speaker this morning. Mr. Walter, Walter Isaacson is currently the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, a nonpartisan educational and policy studies institute based in Washington, D.C. He has been chairman and CEO of CNN and the editor of Time magazine. He is the author of Einstein, His Life and Universe, Benjamin Franklin, An American Life, and Kissinger, A Biography, and co-author of The Wise Men, Six Friends, and the World They Made. Mr. Isaacson was born in New Orleans. He is a graduate of Harvard College and of Pembroke College of Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He began his career at the Sunday Times of London, and then the New Orleans Times Picayune? I say that with care, I'm not really, I, I guess that's how it's pronounced. Picayune states item. He joined Time Magazine in 1978 and served as a political correspondent, national editor, and editor of a new media, uh, of new media before becoming the magazine's 14th editor in 1996. He became chairman and CEO of CNN in 2001, and then president and CEO of the Aspen Institute in 2003. He is chairman of the board for Teach, uh, excuse me, chairman of the board of Teach for America, which recruits recent college graduates to teach in under, undeser, underserved communities. He is also chairman of the board of the U.S.-Palestinian Partnership, set up by the U.S. State Department to promote economic and educational opportunities for the Palestinian people. He is on the board of United Airlines, Tulane University, Society for Science and the Public, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. He was appointed after Hurricane Katrina to be the vice chairman of the Louisiana Recovery Authority. Uh, as President Beebe already mentioned, he spoke at this morning's President's Breakfast, a wonderfully engaging talk. We very much appreciated hearing from him, and we counted a real privilege and pleasure for you to join us this morning to engage in conversation uh, with the Westmont community. So thank you for being here, Mr. Isaacson. Thank you, Dr. And now I'd like to invite each of our four panelists to introduce themselves, Fern Lim, Graham Valenta, Katie Zertsky, and Michael Gardner. We'll start with Fern. Hi, my name is Fern Lim and I'm a senior here. I'm from San Diego and I'm double majoring in physics and art. Here at Westmont, I co-lead a service learning group called Racial Equality and Justice. And we bring a group of students and faculty to Mississippi and Alabama over spring break to serve with the John Perkins Foundation. 
Currently, I'm vacillating between slight panic and great excitement at the many possibilities of a post-graduation future, which could potentially include teaching in the Mississippi Delta with Teach for America, a 10th <laughs> a 10 month stint with AmeriCorps or grad school in the field of 3D animation. My name is Graham Valenta and I'm also a senior here. I'm, I'm from Denver, Colorado and I'm majoring in psychology, philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. Eventually, I'd like to attend a graduate program in the philosophy of religion, hopefully becoming a professor and joining faculty like a school like here. In my free time, I enjoy making copies of reprographics, sorting <laughs> mail at the post office, <laughs> building potato cannons, and performing brain surgery on rats. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katie Zersky, and I am from Salem, Oregon. Um, I'm currently a senior, and I'm triple majoring in mathematics, biology, and chemistry. Um, after graduation next year, I plan on attending medical school to become a physician. Um, I enjoy spending time with friends. I'm an avid knitter, um, and I love watching college football. <laughs> My name is Michael Gardner, and I'm a <laughs> and I'm a senior, double majoring in physics and computer science. While at Westmont, I'm a member of Westmont's club rugby team. I grew up in Maputo, Mozambique, and went to high school in Nairobi, Kenya. And for the future, I am planning on going on to graduate school in physics with the intention of becoming a physics professor. Thank you. And so in order to begin this morning, we've uh, asked Fern to ask the first question of Mr. Isaacson, and we'll go down the line from there. Fern. Mr. Isaacson, in your book, you describe Einstein as one who cared passionately about humanity and sometimes about people. Einstein is also quoted as saying that striving for social justice is the most valuable thing to do in life. How do you reconcile the discrepancy between Einstein's care and concern for humanity and his lack of care for much of his family? And what can we learn from him in terms of our responsibility to each other? Thank you, Fern, and uh, good luck with Teach for America. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is working now. <clears throat> the sentence I wrote that you quoted tried to put a little edge to that fact, that he cared a lot about humanity and sometimes about the humans around him. Uh, I think we all know people like that. People can have, be great crusaders for social justice, care a lot about humanity, but sometimes they have trouble with their own interpersonal relationships. And it was true even of Benjamin Franklin, and I suspect if you look around, it's true of a lot of people, uh, you know. When you're a biographer, you kind of want everything to hold together. You want your person to be perfect, but you also want to strive at the truth. So you give the reality of each person. The fact that Einstein, for example, was not the best husband, especially with his first marriage, and that that marriage dissolved and, you know, uh, and he was kind of cold to his two sons uh, for a while. Later in life, he reconciles very much with his sons. He has a happy marriage. He, all of his family, I think we were talking earlier, uh, uh, Dr. Beebe lived in Princeton for a while, but in 112 Mercer Street, right near where Dr. Beebe lived, Einstein lived and he had his uh, stepdaughter, he had his second wife, he had three or four members of his family all living with him. So through his life, he becomes a warmer and more decent person to those around him, not just to humanity in general. But I think that um, as you do a biography, it's often useful to realize that these are real human beings. They're not somebody on a poster or somebody on a pedestal. And so they have their human flaws. They're sometimes not uh, perfect. And that doesn't diminish them when you're writing a biography. You're not putting that in to try to cut them down to size, but it makes them feel more human. It reminds you they're made of flesh and blood, not of marble. In your book, you analyze Einstein's religious views. You reference Einstein's belief in the pantheistic god of Spinoza and the deistic beliefs of his later life. But Einstein himself pointed out on several occasions that he was not an atheist. However, authors such as Richard Dawkins have interpreted Einstein's affirmation of pantheism as nothing more than an awestruck view of the mysteriousness and elegance of nature. Was Einstein really just, as Dawkins has put it, 
a sexed up atheist? And can you describe the character of the religious views of Einstein? That's a good question. I think everybody here, especially in a college like this that has a deep religious tradition, can look inside yourself and realize that over the periods of years, you change a bit. You go through periods of doubt and then through greater faith. And so it's hard to pick any one exact answer for an Einstein. But we have to listen to him and believe that he knows himself better than anybody. And he insists, I'm not an atheist. In fact, when the he says, when the fanatical atheists try to grab me as one of their own, that upsets me the most because I have a deep reverence and a deep faith. Uh, he also said, and I know you were there this morning when I talked about it, that it was a topic far too vast for his limited imagination. Now, I know Einstein's imagination. It's bigger than most of ours. And that was a mark of humility. There are things we just don't know. We are searchers in this world. So Einstein did not believe in a personal interventionist God, a God you could pray to and make the football team win or the rain stop or whatever it may be. He believed that miracles were not evidence of God's existence, but the absence of miracles were evidence of his existence because there was a harmony in the universe that he felt reverence for. Uh, that type of deistic view is one that many have held. Uh, he is often accused of being a watered down or uh, whatever you said, gussied up atheist. Uh, but since he says he wasn't, I think we have to take him at his word that he was searching uh, and that he had reverence for the mysteries of the universe, that that guided him. It was his passion as he tried to understand. He used to say, and I mean, I, you probably have read this in your studies, when I try to figure out whether a theory or, is right or not, I ask myself, is this the way God would have made the universe? So he is motivated by that sense even though his uh, views are what you might call a little bit mushy through most of his life. Physicist Eugene Wigner has marveled at what he called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And in your book, Einstein himself is quoted saying, nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. What did Einstein mean by this, and what are some examples from his work that illustrate the connection between the physical world of nature and the theoretical world of mathematics? Also, in what ways did Einstein's view of God affect his belief that nature could be described in simple, elegant, and ultimately mathematical ways? <clears throat> Einstein was not somebody who loved math when he was in college. He was not particularly good in geometry and uh, 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 the type of tensor calculus that he needed for general relativity, for example. And at first, he had a little bit of a contempt, thinking that the great theoretical physicists come up with the wonderful ideas, and then we get to mathematicians who are our assistants, and they write the equations that explain it. And that's the way he worked for a while, until he started his quest for general relativity. As you know from studying it, special relativity just is a theory about time and space and how time is relative depending on our state of motion. But that applies only to constant velocity motion. And so his general theory is called the general theory because it tried to generalize that and make it a theory for accelerated motion and rotation and to tie it into a theory of gravity, which he felt he needed to do. As he is pursuing that, he has one great insight, and it's an a insight of science, which is that the effects you feel when you're being accelerated are the exact same as the effects of gravity. Imagine being in an enclosed chamber, and you feel, and you're in a gravitational field, like right here on the surface of the Earth. What do you feel? You feel your feet being pressed to the floor. You take something out of your pocket, and you drop it, and it falls to the floor, right, at accelerated rate. If you're in that same chamber deep in outer space where there's no gravity, but it's being accelerated upward by, you know, being pulled upward at an accelerated rate, what do you feel? You feel the same thing. Your feet being pressed to the floor, you take something out of your pocket, it falls at an accelerated rate. He called that the equivalence principle, the equivalence of gravity and acceleration. However, that did not get him to the general theory of relativity. He could smell it, but he couldn't get there. 
And so he turns to a friend of his who had gone and taken notes for him during college in math class, because he'd cut math classes all the time, and had this friend, Herman Minkowski, who took math notes for him. He finds his friend and says, you've got to help me. I need some math to figure it out. And what he realizes is that, as I said this morning, a mathematical equation is just like uh, the Lord's brush stroke for painting something in physical reality. So as you develop equations, you can get closer to understanding the physical reality. So they work for an entire year of 1914 through October 1915 on the tensor calculus, the calculations that would describe a four-dimensional field and how it could curve. And just by doing the math, he got closer and finally got the answer of what the theory of general relativity really entailed. He was in a race by the end of 1915 to get the general theory of relativity. Everybody knew what the concept was, but nobody had gotten the final version of the theory. And there was a mathematician named David Hilbert who lived in Göttingen, uh, and Einstein was in Berlin, and they were competing to get there first. And David Hilbert had the advantage of being a much better mathematician. He also had the advantage of not being a physicist at all. He didn't care about the underlying physics. He was just going to do it through the math and get there. And Hilbert almost got there first and finally worked with Einstein a bit. But what Einstein came away from that experience thinking was that mathematics is not just some something you, it's not just a language you use to write down your thoughts after you've had your thoughts. It's a, it's a brushstroke type of a language that can help you get to those thoughts. And just by doing the math, you can understand the cosmos better. His theory that you referred to that sim, uh, nature loves simplicity or God loves simplicity, and that if it were, sim that the best formulation of any theory was the simplest possible mathematical formulation, and that's what he strove for. I do not know if he's right, and you will study that. It is a question of philosophy and mathematics. Does God love simplicity? Uh, Einstein thought so. He thought that by following the notion of a unified field theory that could be done in the simplest way, there would be an elegance to the laws of the universe. As we study quantum theory and quantum mechanics, as you all are doing, you sometimes get the opinion that maybe God doesn't like simplicity, that maybe he likes complexity. Near the end of his life, Einstein, who over and over again would say, I cannot believe that God plays dice with the universe. And that was his way of saying, I can't believe God would let things happen by chance. It has to be guided by simple laws. And finally, as he's sort of studying quantum mechanics and looking at quantum entanglement, he says, well, maybe God does enjoy a game of dice every now and then. So it's hard, it's hard to know whether he was right. And that will be the beauty of your quest, and for that matter, your children and grandchildren's quest to understand this cosmos, is to understand the beauty and the elegance and whether simplicity is part of that beauty or complexity is part of that beauty. Mr. Isaacson, <clears throat> you wrote about the genius of Einstein which uniquely enabled him to contribute to our understanding of the natural world. But along with their incredible intellects, geniuses can also have blind spots that contribute to their inability to live so-called normal lives. What were Einstein's major blind spots in his scientific and personal life, and in what ways did they shape his life and his contributions to the physics world? Yeah, you're very right, Michael. Geniuses often have blind spots. And one of the worst can be arrogance. I think Einstein tried to avoid that because he had a great humility that came from being awed by the beauty of nature. One of his strengths was also one of his weaknesses, which was stubbornness. He just kept believing that, he, you know, he, would, he knew he would get a theory. At one point, to get back to invoking God, um, the... Uh, they prove correct his theory of general relativity by measuring how the light from a distant star is bent by the gravitational field of the sun during a solar eclipse, They're able to photograph the stars behind the sun and see that the light is bent. 
and he gets a telegram, and he's with a graduate student. He shows the graduate student the telegram, and she says, you must be thrilled. He said, yes. He says, you know, well, you must be very, very excited. He said, no, I was always confident that it would turn out that way. And she says, yes, but what would you have felt if the experiment had turned out the other way? And he said, I would have felt sorry for the good Lord because the theory is correct. <laughs> um, and so he had that uh, stubbornness. The stubbornness works in getting him to relativity and getting him to quantum theory and getting him to general relativity. The stubbornness fails him when he spends 30 years, the final 30 years of his life, trying to find a unified theory, the theory of everything, the fact that you could tie to get together all the forces of the universe and the new particles that are being discovered. And he kind of ignored a lot of the, part of the new forces being discovered. Somebody who was at the event last night uh, won the Nobel Prize for, f for discovering the strong force within a strong nuclear force. And that's one of, uh, I think, Dr. Rogers' field is the nucleus of the atom. So he understands the strong force certainly better than any of us will. Einstein was not very good at incorporating the new forces that were being discovered in the early 1950s into his theory. He was so stubborn. So that stubbornness hurt. And also, as I uh, said to Fern earlier, Sometimes his inability to get, around, get along with the people around him um, was a problem. And thirdly, he always defied authority, was very rebellious. Now, this helps him a lot sort of question things. When Newton says at the very beginning of the Principia, time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it. Now, you and I would not normally question that. I mean, Newton says it, and we sort of watch time passing along second by second. But Einstein says, well, how does Newton know that? How do we know that? He's questioning the most obvious things. And that ability to question authority gets him in trouble, gets him kicked out of school, gets him in trouble in college, makes it hard for him to get a job when he graduates from college. And yet, it is the reason he is so good at always not accepting the conventional wisdom, especially when it came to physics. And in 1900, it was a good time to quit accepting the conventional wisdom of physics, as you know. Fern? In your book, you discussed Einstein's criticism of McCarthyism and racial discrimination, as well as his celebration of the ideals of individualism and freedom in the United States. Given that our country has certainly changed since Einstein's days, what do you think he would say about the United States today? He would love the fact that, as Dr. King said, the arc of American history bends slowly, but it bends towards justice. It becomes more and more inclusive. And as President-elect Obama said that moment before he became president, or I guess he was president then, right in his uh, inaugural address, he said, once again, Americans have put their hands on their arc of history, and once again, they have bent it towards justice. So he would be very proud of that. He uh, cared deeply for the notion of tolerance, racial tolerance, uh, intellectual tolerance, intellectual free discourse, not because it was a sweet sentiment, but because he believed it was necessary for good scientific and creative inquiry. That you had to have open minds and you had to respect open minds if you were going to be creative and have good science. And he had grown up in Germany. He had watched the Nazis in Germany. He realized what happens when intolerance represses open minds. You're not going to have the freedom. And he said, only through freedom can you have creativity. Only through freedom can you have the advance of knowledge. So that's why he was against McCarthyism and the loyalty oaths. That's why he was against racial discrimination. He really believed that it was important to allow the tolerance, respect, and freedom of each person's mind so that you get diversities of opinion and thus you would get new ideas. Uh, at one, he very rarely accepted honorary degrees. I mean, he would be happy. He was given them, I think, left, right, and center, but he very rarely went off to go get them. But he went to Lincoln College, not too far from Philadelphia, which was an all-black college because he wanted to make a point. And he stayed there for a few days and even helped teach. And the president of um, that college was a guy named Horace Bond. And Horace Bond introduced him to his son, who was then like six years old. 
and Einstein helped teach him. And now that son, Julian Bond, is the head of the NAACP. And so I do think that Einstein would be quite proud today of the fact that with all of the problems America faces, it always bends the arc of its history towards justice. Throughout the course of the book, you detail broad shifts in Einstein's philosophical thinking, starting with the constructivism of Kant, and then moving to the skepticism of Hume, then on to the extreme empiricism of Mach. And as the consequences of his ideas started to come to light, he ended up being a realist. In your opinion, was there any static, unchanging philosophical assumption that was fundamental to him that he held despite the radical changes in his epistemology? Uh, the major change in his epistemology was the change from what you would call, which you, what we all call radical empiricism, which is the idea that we cannot know that anything exists other than things we can observe. This is you know, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, all the way to Mach, as you put it. Um, and that it makes no sense to say that a tree falling in the forest that nobody hears makes a sound because we have no idea what happens when beyond the veil of what we observe and can observe. Then uh, that helps him get to special relativity because the brilliant leap in special relativity is that you cannot observe time and you can't even observe what is simultaneous. For somebody on a train platform looking at two lightning strikes, the timing of those strikes will look different than it will for somebody in the train. So we can't even observe simultaneity. And what he says is neither the person on the train or the person on the platform is necessarily right or wrong. It's all, all motion is relative. And so that is the basic insight that he uses from David Hume in particular, who he liked to read, that if you can't observe it, it makes no sense to talk about it. So then, other scientists come along and take his theories, and they say that there's an uncertainty principle. Heisenberg, both a philosopher and a physicist, Heisenberg, comes up with the uncertainty principle, which basically says that at the subatomic level, things happen randomly and by chance, and they're affected by our observations of it. And that there is no reality beyond these observations, and we cannot say that a particular, and you know, as I say, I do have Dr. Rogers here who's the expert on it. I'll turn it over to him to comment. But the, you cannot say with certainty the exact position and momentum of a particle at any instant that there's a certain, de there's an, a degree of uncertainty involved. And people like Heisenberg, people like Niels Bohr, people like Max Born would say it means that that particle doesn't actually have an exact position unless we observe it. And Einstein said that's ridiculous. That particle has a position, we just don't know what it is. And they say, well, when you were younger, and this gets back to your question, you were one of these empiricists. You rode David Hume's horse, and you said, if we can't observe it, it makes no sense to talk about it. And he said, David Hume's horse is a great one-trick pony, but we shouldn't ride it too often. So he has changed his mind in his basic belief. And he believes that there, and then you talked about realism being the other thing, he believes that there's an underlying reality. That no matter what Born or Heisenberg or Niels Bohr, anybody says, somewhere there's an underlying reality. And he says, I believe that there's an underlying reality that's beyond our veil of, of, of observing it sometimes. But if we don't believe that there is a reality out there beyond our ability to observe it, I don't know what physics is all about. He says it undermines all of physics to say that there is no reality beyond our observations. As you point out, this is the great divide in the philosophy of science, starting, you probably know better than I, but in my readings, it's you know, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Descartes all wrestle with this. Uh, I'm sure the shadows on Plato's cave probably relate to that very theory of what is observation 
and what is real, and is there an underlying reality beyond observations. Um, it is perhaps disconcerting that Einstein changed his mind. I'd love to be able to answer your question by saying, yes, there was an underlying steadiness to the philosophy. He admits it. He says, no, I've changed my philosophy. I'm no longer a radical empirist. I believe that the good Lord created a reality, and someday we will know what it is. Dr. Rogers, do you want to um, correct me on quantum mechanics? I think you've said it, I think you've said it beautifully. Okay. Mr. Isaacson, in the book you mentioned several factors that contributed to Einstein's genius, including his rebellious personality, intellectual curiosity, dogged determination, and brash confidence. How did the combination of these characteristics and Einstein's superior intellect lead to his scientific successes, and which of these elements were most essential to his creative genius? Also, is a similar combination of characteristics found in other renowned geniuses? What set Einstein apart from the other geniuses of his period was that rebelliousness, I think. And that's the main quality, questioning authority, questioning previous assumptions. If you look at the other scientists of the 1900 to 1915 period, you have Max Planck, who is an absolute brilliant genius. You have uh, uh, people like Poincaré in France who are under, almost getting to the notion of relativity. You have uh, Lorentz who does the Lorentz contraction. They're all trying to figure out why is it that light always travels at a constant speed no matter how you're moving. They're, they're looking at these problems. They're looking at the problems in 1900 where you had sort of a clash suddenly in physics between the ideas of radiation, meaning light and radiant forms of energy, and physical objects. What happens when they intersect? And all of these guys are really smart, but they accept conventional thinking. They can't get their heads around the fact that time may be relative. It may vary. Now, they can get around the fact that it may seem to vary, that some people will feel time is different than the way other people feel time, but it was a huge out-of-the-box leap to say, no, 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 it's not just that you perceive it differently if you're moving fast. Time is different, and nobody's right or particularly wrong. It's not like there's an absolute time, and then some people, it looks different the way if you, you know, look at this card, say, here's the size, but if I look at it this way, it looks a different size, but we all know it has one size. So that leap of the imagination comes from a rebelliousness and a willingness to question conventional thinking that wasn't because he was that much smarter than Planck or Poincaré or Lorentz, who each came up with solutions to the problem of the speed of light, but they got it wrong. I mean, Lorentz thinks everything contracts, as you know, the Lorentz contraction. No, 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 it's not that. It's just that time is different. So. I guess the best thing to make you into a genius, to take you out of the orbit of a Max Planck and a Niels Bohr into the next quantum orbit, which is that pantheon that has merely Aristotle, Galileo, Newton, and Einstein, is that ability to question every assumption, even the most obvious assumption. For the most part, Einstein worked individually on his great contributions in physics, using other scientists mostly as sounding boards or helping out um, with the math. In what way is it possible for people to work with geniuses such as Einstein at a completely different intellectual level? Um, or are geniuses such as Einstein resi resigned to make their great contributions on their own? <clears throat> it's a very good question, especially in studying Einstein. And you're right, Einstein was a loner. Einstein comes up with the theory of general relativity that I described earlier by padding around in his apartment alone in Berlin. He is such a loner and so willing to defy authority that all of his close colleagues at the University of Berlin, remember this is 1914, and if you've studied, I don't know, you've got all these majors, but if you've done European history, Germany has just gone into World War I and is in a total state 
and every other person at the University of Berlin that he worked with and the Prussian Academy had signed the manifesto to the civilized world supporting Germany's entry into the war. One guy doesn't sign it, the junior, the youngest professor there, Albert Einstein, because that's his rebelliousness and questioning authority coming into politics, as somebody asked earlier. And he even writes his own manifesto and becomes the head of the War Resisters League. Now, if you want to talk about being a loner and defying authority, imagine being the head of the War Resisters League in 1914 in Berlin. I mean, that's where you're really out there. Um, and so he's shunned by all of his colleagues. And the only guy working with him is briefly this mathematician, Minkowski, who's back in Zurich, where he says, I need the tensor calculus. And they, he goes back and visits him, and they work together on it. But otherwise, he doesn't collaborate that well. That is, gets back to sort of the flaw, but also the human, the human nature of Einstein, which is he loved humanity, but he was not a great collaborator. Uh, Niels Bohr, close friend, but also sort of a rival of Einstein, the head of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. There's an entire Copenhagen school that comes out of it, all these students of of uh, Niels Bohr are there, and he gathers them around. They have symposiums. They work together. They collaborate. They, the advancement of quantum mechanics is not one person. It's not Schrodinger, Heiding, uh, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Max Born. It's all of them hanging around together in colloquia. General relativity and special relativity is this loner padding around in an apartment by himself. Uh, Nowadays, I think it's more difficult to be a loner in science. Science is so much more complex, and it helps to work on a team. It helps to be collaborative. Um, I would say it was probably a flaw of Einstein that he was good to students, he was you know, good to his colleagues, but he was not that collaborative. He shared all, he was very open. I mean, he, it wasn't like he hoarded his stuff. Every time he had something, he'd publish it that Thursday at the Prussian Academy. Uh, but he was not that collaborative of an individual. And as for all geniuses, I don't know. The, I think Ben Franklin's a genius. And if you read about, if you read my book on Ben Franklin, he's at the other extreme. This guy is so clubbable. There ain't one evening between you know 1709 and 1780, I think, that he spends alone. He doesn't pad around his apartment. He is gathering his clubs, the leather apron clubs. He wants groups. He, uh, he builds himself a big old dining room so he can always have people there to discuss things with him. And his genius comes from collaboration. And so I guess there's no right answer. You can be a genius and collaborative, and you can be a genius and be a loner. And we just have to respect the diversity of the way people operate. Is that, yeah. no. I hope I haven't gone too fast. They said there were eight <laughs> questions. And they're, they're, we have more questions, okay. no worries. All right. Um, too fast. Yeah. <laughs> Einstein championed the creation of a one world government to facilitate I'm the world right. powers. Einstein championed the creation the champion, yeah. of a one world government to faci facilitate the world powers and keep nucle nuclear power in check. How would he view our world today, and would he still believe in the feasibility of a one world government? Yes, he was a world federalist, and he believed that the creation of the atom bomb meant that nationalism, the notion that nations could have rivalries in their own interests and just compete against each other, was insane in a world in which nations could also have nuclear weapons. He was always against nationalism. When he became the head of the War Resisters League in 1914 in Germany, he came to believe that the reason Europe had gone to war in World War I, and I think he was right, was an excess of nationalism. I mean, it was nation states asserting their interests and powers, and that if you had not just a United Nations or a League of Nations, but a, United, a UN that had a real power to control nuclear weapons, a world federal system, that would be much better. If you study the intellectual history of the 20th century, the notion of world federalism was very big in the 1950s. Uh, regular folks, liberal and conservative, Norman Thomas, uh, uh, Norman, uh, Norman Cousins, who did Saturday Review, many people joined the World Federalist Movement to get military power away from nation states into a World Federalist government. 
that was considered somewhat naive then, and people asked Einstein, you know, how do you think World War III will be fought? And he says, I don't know, but I know how World War IV will be fought with sticks and rocks if, because of nuclear weapons if we're not tr careful. But the whole notion of a world federalism kind of receded, and it was just considered naive. Uh, it probably was naive. I don't know how you could get in this day and age to a global federal system in which nations could be like the states are in the United States but still have military power in the sort of global federal uh, system. Uh, and nowadays we're not getting very close to it and he died somewhat frustrated. I mean on his deathbed he signs the Bertrand Russell Albert Einstein Manifesto calling for world federalism and peace in the atomic age. Um, I, as I say, I think his theories were naive, but you have to remember every theory he had was considered naive for about 20, 30 years until people caught on that he was right. So I fear that we may wait too long, still think he was naive about that, and then say, oh my dear, he was right. In your book, you provide a pretty accessible explanation of some pretty complicated physics. Could you talk about the process you went through to get a handle on that material and then distill it into ideas that non-specialists There are wonderful involved? books written on Einstein, and I'm sure you will t uh, tackle some of them, including Abraham Pye's Subtle is the Lord, which deeply go into the physics and the mathematics behind the physics. What I wanted to do was to have a book that tried to get the theories in a comprehensible way, but still showed you the magic and the beauty of those theories if you were not a physics major at Westmont, but just wanted to understand the way you can appreciate Shakespeare or Stravinsky or any other great work of art, that science is a great work of art as well. So I studied, uh, you know, people who are not like you and who are not studying science sometimes get intimidated by science. And I said, well, that's wrong. We need science and math to be celebrated in this new century. We should all celebrate it and not just say, let's have teachers cram it down the throats of our kids, but I get intimidated by it. So I took this as an opportunity for me to study physics and math. I used to love math. My father's an engineer. Uh, I studied science and math quite a bit when I was younger, but I'm, I don't have professional training. So I gathered one of the joys of the Aspen Institute is, you know, you can get anybody you want to come help you if you're at the Aspen Institute. A lot of physicists, Murray Gell-Mann was the particle physicist who did quantum uh, mechanics with me and helped rewrite. Brian Green, who wrote Fabric of the Cosmos, did general relativity with me. A guy named uh, Doug Stone, who's at Yale, and Richard Merman, who's at Cornell, helped tutor me in special relativity. And I just asked a whole lot of questions, then made them read it over and over again. I studied for a while the math underlying general relativity, because in some ways, as you know, the science is not that hard in relativity, or for that matter, quantum theory. But the math is pretty difficult. And even Einstein felt that. He had the science of general relativity licked by even by 1912, but it takes him until 1915 to get the math that describes the whole theory. So I did try to study tensor calculus, but then I did not put it much in the book. I wanted to know the tensor calculus so that I could um, feel confident about what I was saying. But the better you know it, the more you can avoid having to say it and the more you can simplify it. You talk in your book about how Einstein's work at the patent office encouraged him to question assumptions. Could you speak on how we in our generation can encourage each other to question assumptions for the good of our society? Well, I think that is the goal of a liberal arts education. That is why you are in college. And the most difficult things you have to do is not just learn to question authority or question assumptions, because as a parent of a teenager, I know that comes naturally. The hard thing is not thinking out of the box, because I know that comes naturally. 
It's knowing what's in the box before you start thinking out of it. People often come up to me after I talk about Einstein and say, I'm just like Einstein. I'm rebellious and I think out of the box. And I say, yeah, but he actually knew, you know, classical physics before he rejected the notion of Newtonian absolute time. And so the tricky thing is not how to learn to question authority, but to know how to do the most important and difficult balance in life, which is when to hold true to your principles and your deep beliefs, and when to be tolerant and open and question those principles and be open to other ideas. And people get it wrong all the time. They either cling too hard to the conventional beliefs they've been taught, or they reject them too much, too quickly. And even Benjamin Franklin had to he got it wrong on slavery. He believed in the compromising, and he compromised at the Constitutional Convention on slavery. And then afterwards, he realized I was wrong. I should have held true to my principle, which is that any uh, tyranny over any of our fellow man is something that I find abhorrent, and he should have not compromised on slavery. And so he becomes the head of the president of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery, and he spends the last years of his life fighting against slavery. I don't think that there's one simple formula, like a mathematical formula, that says, here's when you question authority, and here's when you hold true to certain verities and principles. If there was, you wouldn't have to write long books about it, and you wouldn't have to go to college. But a liberal arts education, that above all is what it should teach you, is how to be both open-minded, but true to principles. Any final? Or? We? We are about out of time. Michael, um, if, if you can ask a brief question, we can do yeah, it in two minutes, we will wrap it up. Michael. Okay, I have a question, quick one. As an insider in the media world, what dangers do those in the media and viewers face that are new to our current situation? I think that the digital age has allowed us to have thousands of channels, <coughs> thousands of internet sites or whatever, and that is a wonderful thing, because it provides you much more information and much more diversity of opinion. But what you lose is the common ground, which is that when I grew up, everybody watched the newscast, and we were told that's the way it is, and we all then were at the water cooler the next day and had a common ground of information. So I think that in the digital revolution, there are two things that must happen. Must happen. One parochial, which I've been writing about recently, which is not everything on the internet should be free. If people do some really great reporting, people should be willing to pay for either journalism or ideas or videos or whatever people make. That intellectual property is the most valuable thing we create in this country. It's what you're going to be creating <coughs> during your life. You want intellectual property to be valued, not something that's spread on the internet for free. And secondly, on the internet, we have to find ways to find common ground instead of the divisiveness and polarization that the blogosphere sometimes creates, we have to be able to transcend that and use the wonders of the blogosphere to help bring us towards our values as opposed to polarizing us away from our values. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Mr. Isaacson. You've given us a wonderful view into the life of an iconic figure in a broader sense about the man in, in all that he was, and we appreciate that. And I just want to thank the panelists, Fern, Graham, Katie, and Michael, for all of your hard work in putting these talks together. And finally, I would just like to thank Mr. Isaacson for taking the time to talk with us. Um, you have a wealth of uh, experience and knowledge to share with us and just a, a wonderful grasp on the nature of genius. I especially uh, appreciate you bringing in Benjamin Franklin because we do tend to perhaps look at genius more narrowly in certain fields but not recognize it in others. And so you've certainly enlightened us and inspired us to recognize that each of us has potential. If we can question assumptions and push forward and just do it, I just, for some reason I like that Nike byline, just do it. Um, we can do things that we might not even be able to imagine. So Mr. Isaacson, thank you so much for inspiring and, and uh, engaging us today.